So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. The humble Nelson Town Hall has been the center of an artistic and musical community for many decades. This is not surprising. Nelson, in spite of being a small village with practically no industry and no commerce, has been a haven of creativity, nurturing writers, artists, and musicians for much of its history as a town. Nelson and the town hall in particular have a legendary status. How did this happen? Well, let's listen to what Gordon had to say almost 40 years ago. The hall was built in 1787, and as far as I know, starting right at that time, people got in here and they danced, and they did many of the same dances then that we're doing now. But there's been dancing in this hall almost continuously since it was built, and there are very few other towns that, that have carried the dancing on in that tradition. So what you just saw was me in 1983 telling lies. Yes. In my defense, there was a date on the hall at that time that reinforced the misinformation that there had been dancing in the hall since 1787. That has since been corrected. But as we shall see, I wasn't the only one who innocently promoted the Nelson legend. In fact, my own enthusiasm was really reinforced by the old timers I encountered when I came here and by the creative energy that I tuned into early on. We'll get back to that, but first let's look at a little history of the hall. So our current Nelson Town Hall is actually the third structure that was built in Nelson to house town government. The first built in 1773, was a small rough building that served early settlers of Packersfield, as Nelson was then called. As the population grew, a large two-story meeting house was built in 1787, the date we often refer to. So 1787 on the hill above the current village the site of this commemorative rock that we can see at the Nelson Cemetery today. So in 1846, the present town hall was built down on the plain where a small village was developing. The 1787 meeting house was dismantled and some salvaged material was brought down the hill and used in the 1846 construction. So here's a picture of the hall looking into the village, probably around 1870. Notice the steps leading up to the town hall. The hall was several feet higher than it is today. The basement was much larger then and, were, and was used for storage for the village store and even for housing livestock. Sometime around 1880, the building was lowered to the configuration that we know today. A building this old needs regular tender loving care. So here we are in 2015, renovating the hall and completely replacing the old rubble foundation, thanks to a major investment by the town. The slope that we used to have in the floor is famous. We surveyed it once and found that the far corner was seven inches lower than the near corner. During a dance, the dancers would slowly drift toward the low spot until nearly everyone was bunched up down there. 
several contradances have been written about it, such as Getting Out of the Hole at Nelson by Rich Blase. When it came time to renovate, some wanted the slope to remain, but we had to renovate and we had to fix the slope because that sloping floor was the expression of many problems with the aging construction of the hall. But one thing that wasn't a problem with the uh, construction of the hall is remember when we talked about the 1787 meeting house built up where the cemetery is now? Well, here we can see some of the recycled building materials. There are six load beams that span the entire width of the old town hall and are notched to receive the chestnut joists. These massive beams are notable also because they have a tight grain with few knots and appear to be hemlock. Hemlock today rarely grows this tall and the rings of today's trees indicate wide and more rapid growth, which would never produce a stick of lumber as impressive and durable as these 230 year old beams. The same issues with the old foundation that had led to the slope in the floor had also put a decided tilt into the town hall walls, especially on the side that faces the town offices. The device you see here was used slowly over a period of many days to pull the wall back to vertical, where it was then also reinforced to keep it that way. So what is it about the Nelson Town Hall that evokes such fondness? Not all of this can be ascribed to mystical properties. Basic physics come into play. The hall has wooden walls, a wooden floor, and a wooden ceiling that is high enough to allow sound to travel, but low enough to keep it from echoing. It is a small enough, it is small enough that sophisticated amplification is not necessary. And finally, in its simplicity of design, there are no distractions. One is forced to pay attention to the music because that's all there is to do. By the early 1980s, it was becoming a regular concert and dance venue and has remained such. Uh, and in its frequent use provided some of the justification for the substantial repairs and renovations. But the town hall, like the town itself, has absorbed and transmitted the creative energy that has been abundant in Nelson for a long time. Um, so this is a quote from a book about the Pennsylvania Settlement Art Colony. And the book was written by local Nelson author, Terry Upton about the art colony, which dates from the late 1800s. So this is what Terry wrote. Um, the creative and academic spirit found in the Pennsylvania settlement colony thrives to this day. Nelson remains home to writers, artists, scholars, and musicians. Creativity is present in the descendants of the colonists, and it is present in the general population. The lovely rugged landscape, which first attracted people to settle this area, retains its allure. The strength and serenity found in Nelson's Hills encourages the freedom and individuality a creative soul craves to flourish. So the Pennsylvania settlement began in 1891 with the arrival of several families at that time, the population of Nelson was 332 people. The town at that time in 1891 had been in a steady decline from its highest population of about 1,100 people in 1810, 80 years earlier. And our population would reach its low point in 1930 with only 162 residents. At that time, it might have been even fewer, but for the arrival of people fleeing to their summer homes, having lost their fortunes at the start of the Great Depression. 
Marie Spaeth was just one of many celebrated artists associated with the Pennsylvania settlement. Consider the impact of having so many creative spirits in such an overall small population. By the early 1940s, when this dance with Ralph Page calling took place, the population went a bit north of 250, but then declined, not getting above 300 until 1970. See the poster in the background, which announces a new Wednesday night dance series beginning June 11th, 1941. From the information we have at this time, it seems that there were cycles, periods when there were weekly dances, times when there were only summer dances, and times when there were only winter dances, and sometimes just once or twice a year. Newt Tolman, who was born in 1908, references dances and music that were part of the lives of his parents and earlier generations, so we know what was going on then. As I and many others started hanging out in Nelson, the legend was already here, put forth by those who came before, who spoke not with the intention to deceive, but with a passion for the dance and the music and all that it meant to this small town. It didn't hurt that many of the people involved were larger than life characters themselves. While people might have been savvy enough not to believe everything they said, the enthusiasm was infectious. Here's a clip from some old timers who were interviewed in 2004. What I've always been interested in, in is that up until about 75 years ago, I would say, um, maybe, maybe even maybe even only 60 years ago, the, the kind of dancing that we do in this region, the traditional dance, not, not the new stuff, but the mm -hmm. traditional dancing, was not done outside of this area. Mm -hmm. That's right. We'll say 75 years ago, maybe. Absolutely. So what, what, what fascinates me is that why did this place have a handle on it? I, I've always often wondered that, but of course, everybody knows that it's true. Yeah. If you go back to any any historian that knows anything about square dancing, Nelson square dancing. Yeah. You know. Well, we but, talk to people in New York City today, and you just have to mention Nelson Town Hall. Yeah. Right. Uh, they yeah. know all about yeah. it. I think a lot of it has to do with the isolation of the area. I think that. Well, it's a strong path because it's, 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 there's no major highways leading in or out, and severe winters, and a lot of French, Canadian, Irish, Scottish people living here that, that contributed to it. And then, and then the wealth that came from the summer people because of the lakes, and then oh, yeah. somewhat from the mills. They had a combination 20 miles up the road here in Hillsboro. They don't know how they're talking about no. when you no. first jig. Absolutely. Yeah. But what actually happened is you had a combination of people who came together, Newt and Fran and Quig and a few others, who knew these old dances and and they sort of died out. And uh, with Ralph Page and one thing or another, it was this group that revived the dances around here and they were the old dances that they yeah. remembered. And that's basically what happened. Yeah, the snow, it's like snowball. Yeah, they kept going. They kept going. Yeah. Yeah. Among the people we saw in that video were Barney Quigley, whose father, Albert, known as Quig, was an artist and a fiddler who lived right next to the town hall. And Ren Tolman, whose father, Newt, was a major part of the music in Nelson. Newt was also a writer and a rather strong character, so his enthusiasm about music and dance and Nelson influenced a lot of people. In 1973, Newt wrote, some of us like to think that in our little old Nelson Town Hall back in the 1930s, we played a large part in starting what became a national revival of the square dance. We put out a book on the subject, which is still a standard text. Our local prompter, caller if you like, was the first to go on to national and finally international recognition. And for many years, we played authentic music not heard anywhere else. Newt published the Nelson Music Collection in 1969 at a time when there were not many other written sources of the music notation. 
In addition to his book, Quick Tunes and Good Times, he published articles in Yankee Magazine and elsewhere, helping to enhance the Nelson mythology. Dance caller Ralph Page, who grew up in Munsonville, wrote in 1970, we were lucky in my hometown of Nelson, New Hampshire. With a total population of less than 400, there were five good fiddlers and an exceptional prompter, several who could chord it on a piano or an organ, as well as a sterling five-string banjo player. With this sort of musical base on which to build, more often than not, you will find a town with a lot of good dancers living in it. So it was with Nelson. Ralph Page became quite famous during the square dance fad of the 1940s and 50s with regular gigs in New York City, Florida, and the fancy hotels of the North region of New England. And just a personal story, when my godmother, Bonnie Allen Riley, went to Africa in 1963 to teach for two years, she brought several Ralph Page records with her. She held lively dances in Nigeria to Ralph's recorded voice and his band of Nelson musicians. Dudley Lofman, unlike Ralph Page, was not from Nelson, but even so, he had an outsized influence on the Nelson Contra dances. He was among the first of the younger generation in the 1960s to show appreciation for the traditional tunes and dances that were still being done in places like Nelson. A 2009 National Endowment for the Arts Heritage Fellow, Dudley maintains his connections to Nelson and in the recent past could be found leading discussions and even a dance for the Rhodes Scholars when they did their twice yearly educational trips to Nelson. From about 1965 until the late 1970s, the dances were run by the Nelson Square Dance Association. And in later years, Dudley was the primary caller for those dances. In 1980 or thereabouts, after a brief hiatus in the dances, there was a sort of handoff where Bonnie Riley and Hallie Robinson gave the association's accrued savings, which was a few hundred dollars, to the newly founded Monadnock Folklore Society so that they could carry it on. Putting the dances in the hands of the Folklore Society occurred at a time when there were other developments. In 1978, Peter Temple had started the Monday Night Dance in Nelson in Clark Hall, which was above the Harrisville store. Within a few years, that dance had moved to Nelson. Meanwhile, Dudley, who had been a mainstay caller in the area, was sufficiently busy that there was often a vacancy for a caller. For some time, Jack Perrin took up this job, and in fact, he helped enrich the legend by being the first to refer to Nelson as the contradance capital of the world. Jack introduced musicians such as brothers Randy and Rodney Miller to Nelson. Jack and Randy eventually collaborated on several tune books, which have become absolute standard references for dance musicians. And because the Monday Night Dance was sort of an open mic for callers, people like Mary DeRozier and Steve Zakon Anderson got their start there and went on to become well-established callers. The Monday Night Dance has been, and will continue to be, an incubator for callers and musicians. We've been talking about the traditional music and dance scene in Nelson. What were some of the other musical activities going on which contributed to Nelson's reputation? In 1966, Conductor James Bowley brought several of his musical colleagues from the big cities for concerts in the Nelson Congregational Church. This marked the beginning of Monadnock Music, which remains a vibrant musical organization. These concerts continued as an annual summer event in Nelson until just a few years ago, and we hope they will return again one day. In 1973, 
we saw the formation of the Apple Hill Chamber Players, now the Apple Hill Center for Chamber Music, a world-renowned organization. It was not unusual for the classically trained Apple Hill players to drop in on dances, admiring the very different approach to music that contradance musicians provided. Apple Hill launched a summer music program for young musicians, and it soon became a tradition for these young people from all over the world to visit the Monday dance during the summer. Having Apple Hill in Nelson added and continues to contribute to the musical mystique of our town. Nelson has a long history of town bands. First, we see a fife and drum corps in 1885. Then, Edgar Seaver's band performing for the dedication of the Civil War tablet on the Nelson Town Hall in 1915. The current Nelson Town Band began in 1989 when Louise Dirker and her husband Dave Paddock, playing drum and flute respectively, marched up the hill from the Nelson Common to the cemetery, a steep quarter mile, on Memorial Day. Today the band has over 40 members and plays concerts throughout the Monadnock region from May into October. In the mid-70s, Alouette Island started a monthly coffee house featuring local performers in the Brick Schoolhouse, where the town offices are now. The space was then a big open room with a wood stove and a very modest kitchen. Alouette and various helpers would cover tables with India bedspreads and candles were set in empty Chianti bottles. Regular participants, in addition to Alouette, were George Bogosian, Katie Gilbert, Russ Thomas, Bill and Dawn Matthews, Harvey Tolman, Jason Little, and many others. The coffee houses were cozy and comforting and set a nice tone for the town as a haven for folk music. Somewhere in there, Alouette had become friends with Maine folk singer Gordon Bach and persuaded him to come down from Maine and do a concert in Nelson at the town hall. For such an established musician to grace the Nelson Town Hall was a coup. And what was more amazing is that it, it evolved into an almost annual event for many years. This certainly helped in laying the groundwork for other concerts. Today, the Monadnock Folklore Society is the sponsor of most of the concerts in Nelson as well as the Monday night dance. We do hope to be able to resume in-person events later in 2021. Dancers, concert performers, and audiences find enchantment in the hall that goes beyond the recreational experience. Countless musicians have come into the hall for the first time and it's empty and they comment on what a magical place it feels like. Something that is confirmed for them when they experience the Nelson audience. And people have listened. Here are some of the performers who have played in Nelson over the last 40 years.
fiddler Harvey Tolman, the mainstay of the Monday Night Dance, has also been very influential in the prevalence of Cape Breton music in Nelson concerts. He first heard Cape Breton music in the early 1960s, he began fiddling in that style, nurtured by frequent visits to Cape Breton and meeting musicians there. When such luminaries as the late Jerry Holland and Buddy McMaster, and more recently, Troy McGilvray and Andrea Beaton and many others have played in Nelson, they encounter an audience already familiar with the tunes and musical nuances, an audience to which they always enjoy returning. In his book, Mosquito Bush, Fran Tolman's caption for this image reads, Cassius Taylor says he isn't going to play in the town band anymore. Not since the committee hired an outside band to play for the old home day square dance. What they want to go and get that crowd in for? Paid them $40, $40. Why, me and the boys would have gone and blowed our guts out for five. To me, this has been one of the mainstays of the Nelson scene. We've always had local folks willing to do what was needed to have music and dance with great enthusiasm and dedication. So that, uh, that brings to a close the formal part of our presentation this morning. And Lisa, I think we did great. We were looking for 30 minutes and it's 1131. So not, not bad. Um, and what we'd like to do now uh, is is open it up uh, for comments and how this is going to work. We're going to do it the old fashioned way. If you would like to speak, well, you'll need to take yourself off mute, but we'd also like you to raise your hand the old fashioned way, because that is going to be easier for us than people raising their hand through the zoom function like that. And Lisa's going to be, uh, uh, monitoring uh, your pictures there. And if she sees a raised hand, she's going to make a note of who you are, and then she's going to ask you to speak. But to uh, to kick things off, I did see a, a comment come in from uh, Brian Cartwright, who I haven't seen for decades, by the way. So Brian, maybe you could maybe you could uh, open up with uh, the thing that you wanted to say, because it's a great part of the story. Hey, everybody. Um, <clears throat> it's great to see everybody and uh, hear these stories. And, and um, I, was, I was very humbly honored to be hired as a carpenter on the town hall and, um, in, around 1990. And um, the, uh, apparently the, um, the selectmen wanted me to fix up the... Uh, heating system, not that I'm a heating engineer or anything close to it, but they got some engineering firm to, to specify ducts, and I made those ducts out of plywood and whatever boards I had available, and I'm sure they're gone by now. But one interesting story that, uh, that, that was a, a revelation for me is that when I was doing the 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 duct that long four by 24 duct that ran under the floor of the town hall from the front to the back, from the stage to the furnace room, and then came up into, uh, I guess it was a return, no, it was a supply duct anyway. Um, there was no filter in the system. And so the revelation was that every time people came in on a Monday and did a, did a stamp balance, they were kicking up mounds of dust, which then the heating system would circulate through the hall and explain the uh, notorious dustiness of the Nelson Town Hall. Um, the other funny thing was, um, not so funny, when I was in the attic that I discovered a lot of small caskets. It was very spooked out by that. And the story was that uh, 
in the 1800s, there was so much typhoid that they just had the town carpenter make extra caskets in child size and have them on hand. A sad commentary. Fortunately, those, not all those caskets were needed, but good right. to see everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and the first hand I saw was Rich Hart. So Rich, please unmute yourself. All right, here I am. Um, I've got a couple of things. You had mentioned uh, local callers, um, Steve Zakon Anderson and Mary DeRosier that uh, got their start in Nelson. There are also a lot of callers elsewhere in the country. One that I can think of is Diane Silver, who now calls down in North Carolina. Um, the, uh, the other thing you had mentioned when you were talking about Apple Hill and people coming from various places in the country. One time, uh, a number of years ago now, um, during a summer dance, um, I, I realized there were people from a lot of different places. So I figured we'd figure that out, or perhaps we could. So I asked people represented which different countries and which different states in the United States. Um, we counted hands and counted states and counted countries. Um, as it turns out on that particular summer Monday night, there were 19 different US states represented in the hall and 20 different countries. Um, I, I stopped asking that again because uh, later I learned that uh, Apple Hill doesn't like to emphasize what countries people are from in order to emphasize sharing and music and friendship between musicians rather than whatever's happening between various countries. Great, so that's thank, it for me. thank you, Rich. Uh, so Rebecca Sales, I see your hand. You yes, go ahead. thank you. Oh, this is fascinating. I, um, I have a long history with Apple Hill. I attended in 1976. So I have very fond memories of square dancing back then. Um, and uh, I now live and work, I work at Apple Hill and I, I'm back in the area. Um, and we, we are proud to say that we have students from 31 states and 14 countries. Um, but uh, I'm really intrigued by the Pennsylvania Settlement Art Colony. Um, I uh, grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania um, went to a Quaker school and actually dance and music were considered a diversion from the Quaker uh, spirit for, throughout the 19th century. So, um, or up until, I should say, um, the beginning, uh, the late 1800s. So um, I, I'm just really fascinated by that connection to Nelson of, of, of a Pennsylvania um, art colony. I, I'd love to know more about it. <laughs> well, you'll have to go find so, Terry yeah. Upton's book, which I suspect is available at the Olivia Rada Memorial Library, just to give a plug back to our sponsor here. Also, it's, um, it's, it's soon going to be available on the Nelson History website because um, there aren't really copies available for sale, or at least very many, because you know there was a limited print run. But Terry has given permission uh, that we can publish the book, which is about 75 pages uh, on the website. So we're just kind of working with the logistics of that. Uh, but it's a wonderful story. And um, if you just keep in touch um, with us on that, or maybe I can just send out a mailing to everyone who was on this meeting uh, when that happens, probably in a couple of months. Great, thank you, Gordon. I see Kathy Shillamat's hand. So Kathy, please unmute yourself. Just a note, um, that book is available at the Historical Society Bookstore. So um, the Pennsylvania Settlement book is available as well as some other books and um, cassettes related to Contra Dance in Nelson. That is a great plug. That's in fact the Historical Society of Cheshire County in Keene is, is probably the best place to get a number of the books that we've used as references for today's talk. Hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to see everyone. And I would like to, well, I got a lot of things to say, but I'm going to keep it to a great word of thanks to Harvey, who's been so generous. Everyone down there is, but I grew up in Kentucky. And of course, 
as far as I've been concerned, there was only one thing in the world which was kind of old time music and bluegrass. <laughs> but after I got out of college, I went to work at the uh, Otter Lake Conservation School. And uh, somehow I ended up going to a bunch of dances and including the one in Harrisville with Harvey. And I was kind of a beginning fiddle player. <laughs> and Harvey, I think I said something to him and he just unstrapped his, his little amplifier from the back of his fiddle and put it on mine and said, why did you try it? <laughs> Which is wonderful. And he's been a great friend ever since. And I just love Harvey and all the folks down there, but it's, it's been so wonderful. And uh, I just wanted to say that because just Harvey's a wonderful, wonderful person. And I appreciate that so much. I, we happen to have some cousins in Keene that nobody in my family in Kentucky knew except me. I discovered them when I worked there. And uh, they're the ones who taught me how to be a Yankee as far as I've been able to manage. <laughs> so that's it. Thanks to everybody, but particularly to Harvey, Frankie, and just a wonderful fiddler and a wonderful friend. Hi, I just have to second that tribute to Harvey. Um, I actually have a question. It's always struck me that there's been a, a, a good supply of great musicians. And um, Nelson is a small town. And is it typical for a town that size to have that many local folks available? And the yeah, sort of second part of it is uh, the, the, the photos and the stories from the kind of middle, early and middle part of the last century, they have these very eclectic bands. Uh, we saw a photo of, you know, Ralph and a sax and a trumpet as well as a fiddle. And yet we think of the traditional New England sound being kind of fiddle piano dominated. Um, and Nelson is the traditional, you know, keeper of the keys. And yet you see this greater variety back then. What, what do you know about the history and where all these folks came from? Um, Vince, I think one of the one of the reasons why there is this mystery around uh, around Nelson and maybe around the, the dance music in general is that we don't know. There's a there's a huge amount of ignorance, and when you have ignorance, it's very easy to uh, to invent things. Uh, we we but we do we do know that um, you know I mean Newt refers to some of the earlier bands as having horns and flutes and and you know it was a very very different sound. Uh, as a piano player, I've always been curious about where you know where the piano started to to set in because obviously in the very early times um, that wasn't an instrument that was widely available. Um, and um, so I, I think you know we can we can speculate, and there have been a couple of instances where where bands have uh, there was the Brattleboro uh, I can't remember the name of the band, but there was a brass brand in. in Brattleboro that played yeah, dance Brattleboro tunes. Brattleboro brass band, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so it, it it does happen, but really we don't know. And of course there were no recordings, so we can we can really only uh, speculate uh, about that. Um, as but I think, you know, I think some of our strong speculation is is families. You know, if we if we look at this town that got down to 162 residents. And then we have families like, like the Tolmans. Um, Newt and Fran were brothers. Harvey's a, a second or third cousin. Um, but everybody, you know, they've been Tolmans in Nelson for more than 10 generations. Um, then uh, the Duns, which is so an old uh, instant of Duns which is where um, Ralph Page was born into. Um, and so there was a famous prompter in that family as well as other musicians. So, you know, we have to imagine as, as Dudley said in the video, a very isolated town um, that still liked to have a good time. And if they wanted to have a party, they had to make their own music. Um, and as far as instruments like saxophones and trumpets, um, you know, no sound systems back then. And so instruments that didn't need amplification would kind of win out. And therefore you needed callers with big booming uh, voices. But thank you, Vince, for that great question. Another local caller was Duke Miller, who worked with, with Ralph Page. And he called uh, Monday night dances over at the Hill Camp 
um, and at Marineveld, which is now um, Buckingham, Brown and Nichols, you know, a couple of hills over. But he, he would fish in Silver Lake and spend a lot of time in the area. You mentioned that uh, there were dances sometimes in the winter as well as uh, in the summer. Uh, one summer uh, I played for Dudley um, almost every uh, Monday night. Uh, although I'm not sure the dances were on Mondays then. I think they were Saturday nights. And uh, it was a square dance, mostly. And then I was hired by Dudley uh, one winter. They were having a dance, first time in several months, because it was winter. And um, so I drove over, and I had some new Christmas clothes, so I wore them. And we got there, and it was... Um, Nobody had remembered to turn on the heat. So there was a puddle of ice on the floor. <laughs> and needless to say, I never took off my coat, played my accordion for Delhi for the evening. And uh, after a while, the heat of the dancers warmed up enough to melt the ice. Thank you, Sylvia. That's actually a recurring theme in the Nelson Town Hall is arriving to the hall and finding there's no heat. <laughs> It's happened many times in my experience. Gordon, I know it happened to you too. Um, and it is amazing how a hall, which could be well down into the 30s in temperature, um, perhaps even colder, can be warmed up just by dancers dancing to the point where you have doors and windows open by the end of the night. I just want to say that from my a uh, little bit of experience of being involved with the uh, music side of dancing. Um, I want to put in a plug for Allison Aldrich Hunt and 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 Hunt uh, because they would have something called Pie Night and the people would come to her house and jam. And I think they really uh, gave an outlet for a lot of young, really good fiddlers who then went on sometimes to play for the dance. But that was a, that was a wonderful way of people getting together and, and playing that uh, encouraged the music in the area. So yeah, that's a great reminder. And I know Heather has hosted some events like that. I think Chris as well. Uh, so hopefully that's something we can get back to when we can be together again. Um, I just wanted to put in up for that book that Newt wrote, The uh, Quick Tunes and Good Times. It's really a fantastic read for anyone who hasn't read it. It's just really interesting. And he does talk a lot of history of the music and the town hall and playing and um, just some really fantastic stories in there. I really love it. And the other thing I was wondering, um, if Randy be willing to share this story, um, when I got to first play there a couple of years ago, town, the, uh, um, oh, the, the thing in the summer, the, you know, the, the dance that they have, Old Home Day, the Old Home Day dance. And I just met Randy, and, and when I walked into the hall, he was up in the back on the, near the stage, and, um, shared with me the story of when he first started playing there. I don't know if maybe he'd be willing to share. Uh, the mid to late 1970s, um, we had a dance there in Nelson. You know, I think it might have been February, and the temperature was like it is outside today, very, very cold. And um, we got to the hall, and at the time, the... Uh, Nelson resident who was sponsoring and running and unlocking the hall was Natalie McClure. And uh, I walked in and the um, inside of the hall was colder than it was outside. And it was about five degrees outside. And I said, Natalie, let's, where's the heat? Let's turn the furnace on. She said, well, I'm sorry, it's broken. It won't turn on. So we proceeded to have the dance and there was a, a full hall of dancers and I was hired to play piano that night. And luckily I had a, um, a pair of those brown jersey gloves, you know, cotton. And some someone had scissors. I cut the tips of the 
gloves off and managed to play the piano with my gloves on, but the, uh, the ivory keys on the piano, Gordon can attest to that, were, were colder than the room, which was colder than outside. <laughs> Oh, terrible, terrible. You, I know it because the, the dancers can heat themselves up, but the, for the musicians, it's a little bit tougher. Uh, when I was first trying to find out about the local music scene here and had no idea of what was going on, I went into the Toadstool Bookstore in Peterborough and flipped through the local music uh, bin of the CDs. And one of the things I noticed there that every one of those CDs had one person playing on it, and that was Bob McQuillan. And he's certainly an important part of the story. I think um, McQuillan is such an important part of the story that we, we didn't even dare uh, open, open that box for, for this program. Um, I mean, certainly to me personally, he was... He was um, a mentor and one of the most important people in my life. We did, for those of you that were on right at the beginning of the program, we did sort of uh, show a little visual of him uh, looming over uh, the, the town hall. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I expect everyone on the call here is somewhat familiar with the, uh, with McQuillan. Um, that's probably a subject for a, a whole other meeting. I do know that he was, especially the last uh, probably 20 years or so of the Monday Night Dance, he was uh, a very strong uh, fixture there. Uh, but he was so, uh, I, he, he loved Nelson. I think he was identified with music everywhere and not even just in New England. But thank you for bringing, bringing him up. We do miss him, though I think he's never very far away where there's dance going on. We're going to wrap up. Thanks so much for joining us today. To end this program, we've got a special treat. Here's Alouette Island singing her song, Monday Night in Nelson. It's been a day of unfulfillment, and now I'm headed home, looking forward to the comforts of the night. A glass of wine, some peace of mind, a warm room in the dark old time and songs and jokes and friends and candlelight. And I never thought of dancing till I drove into the square. The town hall's bright with steamy light and everyone is there. Everyone that is but me, I think I'll just go in and see and maybe dance if someone needs a partner. Lead me up and down, do -si do below, when we swing look straight into my eyes so we don't get dizzy, you know, and we'll stomp our worries underfoot as we balance in the line, and we won't remember what they were till morning. The room is full of smiling folks who just heard Mary's latest jokes. The lines are forming on the high side of the town hall floor. The rules are ones we understand. The touching, hugging, holding hands. And that is what the contra dance is for. Mary walks us through it once and Harvey starts to play The world beyond these ringing walls slowly fades away The dance demands a focused mind It keeps us all in present time And just for now we all know what to do Lead me up and down, do -si do below when we swing, look straight into my eyes so we don't get dizzy, you know. And we'll stomp our worries underfoot as we balance in the line. And we won't remember what they were till morning. A hundred years ago, these tunes and dances filled this simple room. 
and folks like us with partners facing lined up side by side. And for an evening's time they laid away the work and care of day to day and joined with friends to dance away the night. Now we are here and we will laugh and dance away our time. Then we will pass and leave behind our places in the line. Younger hands will mark the beat, the tunes will call to younger feet, till in the final waltz we all will join. Lead me up and down, do si do below. When we swing, look straight into my eyes So we don't get dizzy, you know And we'll stomp our worries underfoot As we balance in the line And we won't remember what they were till morning Lead me up and down, do si do below when we swing, look straight into my eyes So we don't get dizzy, no And we'll stomp our worries underfoot As we balance in the line And we won't remember what they were till morning